Today, our podcast interview is with Dacker Keltner, full professor at the UC Berkeley Psychology Department and director of the UC Berkeley Social Interaction Lab. Dr. Keltner also serves as the faculty director of the Berkeley Greater Good Science Center and has taught executive education at UC Berkeley for over 15 years. Dacker has published several books as well as 190 scientific articles. He has written for the New York Times, the London Times, and Utney Reader, and has received numerous national prizes and grants for his research. In fact, his research has been covered in Time, Newsweek, the New York Times, the BBC, CNN, NPR, the Wall Street Journal, and in many other outlets. He has collaborated with directors at Pixar and a design team at Facebook, as well as on projects at Google. A renowned expert in the biological and evolutionary origins of human emotion, Dr. Keltner studies the science of compassion, awe, love, and beauty, and how emotions shape our moral intuition. Dacker received his BA from UC Santa Barbara and his PhD from Stanford University. He is the author of the best-selling book, Born to be Good, The Science of a Meaningful Life, and of The Compassionate Instinct. Today, we're going to be focusing on Dacker's latest book entitled, The Power Paradox. Welcome, Dacker. Thanks for joining us today. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Before we dive in and talk about power, can you give me a little background on what drove you to, to try to research that topic? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, um, you know, the power paradox really comes out of 25 years of research that we've been doing um, and then people in different labs around the world. And, and uh, you know, very simply put, I was interested in two questions, which is, um, you know, what is power and how do we fold into social hierarchies in different kinds of contexts? Uh, you know, and I stu I've studied social groups on college campuses and summer camps and organizations and uh, different places to understand who rises and who falls in social hierarchies. And then, you know, alongside that line of research, I was also, for 25 years, really interested in uh, really beginning with my postdoc with Paul Ekman at UC San Francisco on how do we express emotion? You know, this is this ancient language, a mammalian language, really, of subtle movements in the face and the voice and the body and eye contact and through which we convey things like, I'm interested in you, or I respect you, or I'm angry about this, this circumstance. And, and, you know, ironically, what happened is these two lines of work started to dovetail, which is, you know, power in many ways is about empathy and our ability and social intelligence and about reading people really carefully. So it's been a wonderful journey. Yeah, I'm so fascinated by that juxtaposition because when you think about power, you think about the opposite. And in yeah. your, your new book, The Power Paradox, you start talking about Machiavelli and yeah. sort of power <laughs> and how it's manipulation and you know the whole you know legacy of his power juxtaposed against right. what you bring up, the Taoist and Eastern traditions. And I love the quote you have in there um, from the Taoist um, leader, you had to lead the people, walk behind them. Yeah. So can you talk to me about that contrast? Yeah, you know, so it's so interesting. When I started this work on power, and you know, we dissect this in our classes uh, with executives, is that there was this, uh, very, there's this very deep legacy in thinking about what power is that traces back to Machiavelli, right? A 16th century politician in Florence, Italy, who wrote The Prince, which is arguably the most important book in Western thought ever written about power. Uh, and in that book, what he, he argues is that power is really about force and manipulation and coercion and, and violence, uh, animo uh, in the language of his times. Uh, and what we have to remember is books are written in historical contexts, right? And Machiavelli was writing at a time in Florence, Italy, as beautiful as it is, it was arguably one of the most violent places in human history. It was this, as if he was writing a book about power that would apply to the violence of drug cartels, right, or illegal arms uh, salespeople. So, so uh, we've evolved a lot since 15th, 16th century uh, Italy. We have laws and rights and social organizations and forms of accountability. And so, you know, what I argue is uh, those ideas are, of force and manipulation and violence are really outdated and don't apply to power today. What is 21st century power? How do you define that? 
Well, I think what we have to take a look at is all of the social changes, right? So I define power as making a difference in the world, uh, as really altering other people, as influence, right? Um, and what we know today is that we are a social networking society. We are a society that works most of the time in teams, uh, that is getting things done, be it a patent or a scientific discovery or, you know, moving people in a, an emergency room. Collectively, right? We, we do things more collectively today than at any time in human history. And so what that means is power, the ability to get things done or to make a difference in the world, is about stirring other people to effective action. It's about moving other people and inspiring them. So are you saying that in the 21st century with technology, it's a different kind of power play because of that? Yeah, it is. It's radically different. I mean, in every fashion, you know, we have become, we, we do things more collectively today than even 50 years ago, right? We work on interdisciplinary teams in different kinds of sectors, right? We, we are connected to people through Facebook and through new social media. We work in more complicated teams of more women in organizations, people from different backgrounds. And so what that means is the quality of our work is more, it, it really rests upon how well we can inspire and motivate teens. So it really is different than it was 50 years ago. So getting back to this idea, this juxtaposition of what we think power is and yeah. how you get it yeah. and how you really do get it, right. talk to me more about how you get power. Right. So, you know, this one is such an such a interesting discovery in the scientific literature. So, you know, 40 years ago, scientists started to look at, uh, who, you know, drop a human being in a group and who rises to power, who earns the respect of their peers, who has opportunities for influence, right? Who develops a really strong reputation? And, you know, a lot of people have Machiavellian intuitions, like, well, it's, it's gonna be the ruthless manipulator who's charming but deceptive who will rise in those groups. Uh, and that turns out to be dead wrong, right? Uh, that's a stereotype of power, a myth of power that turns out to be misguided. And in fact, you know, what studies find is, you know, and I tend to call it sort of more socially intelligent individuals gain power, but it breaks down to some really simple things like if you really are reaching out to other people and enthusiastic, if you're open to other people's ideas and their feelings, right? If you are really focused on the task at hand, uh, believe it or not, if you're kind, right? Kind people who share resources and opportunities and ideas rise in organizations, um, and you're calm, calm people uh, tend to rise and have perspective and can handle stress, do well. And you know what's striking, Joanne, is that these socially intelligent principles, um, they work for kids on grammar school playgrounds. It's kids who are more socially intelligent, rise in power. They work in every kind of organization you could study uh, in different parts of the world. They work in military units, right? They've actually studied what cadets rise to the position of officer. So they really are um, quite a contrast to the Machiavellian view of power. So we're here on campus at UC yeah. Berkeley, and I think in your book you talk about college dorm as an example of you know, ideas of, of power. And yeah. how people, what, what, can you talk to me about that? Yeah, so you know, one, of the, one of the things that um, the, the science of power that I've been part of has taught us is we really have to and anybody in their own life will recognize this, which is that we used to think of power as like, well, that's just politics or it's money or it's military action. But really, power is everywhere, right? Bertrand Russell, the great British philosopher, said that, you know, energy is the fundamental question in physics. It's about how objects relate to each other. And power is the fundamental question of social dynamics, all relationships have a dimension of power to them. And guided by that, you know, social scientists like myself have studied power dynamics in families, between parents and kids, you know, romantic partners, and then in my own lab, you know, we study who rises to power in dorms at Berkeley, in sororities, fraternities, basketball camps, uh, and again, 
you know, what we do. And, and college dorms allow us to do this as we, you know, they all come their first year. They're excited about being part of this dorm. They don't know each other. They come from different backgrounds. Uh, and then we can study who quickly gains the respect of their peers. And what we find is really interesting, and it replicates, for example, in financial advising firms, which is really quickly people fold into social hierarchies, right? You sort of meet people, you interact with them a bit, and you realize, like, this person's somebody I'd respect and I'd like to see in a leadership position. Um, and then secondly, that kind of reputation you develop kind of moves through your social networks, you know, through casual conversations and gossip and things like that. So quickly, groups of different kinds kind of start to give power to certain kinds of individuals, the people who are good for the group. So it's giving as opposed to getting? Yeah, and again, you know, the, the science, and you know, science is good because it, it challenges our stereotypes and our cultural assumptions, and so there's this, you know, idea out in the, 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 the broad culture of, well, you know, how you get power is you grab it, you know, and we love literature and dramas and television shows about power grabs, right, and we, um, you know, we think about, um, you know, uh, I've been watching Breaking Bad and about, you know, how he, Walter White becomes this Machiavellian and he grabs power. Well, that's fiction, <laughs> and more often, uh, what you see in the organizations that make up our lives is people, groups, kind of give power to certain individuals. And in fact, individuals who want to go out and grab power, right, in Machiavellian ways, quickly develop reputations as Machiavellians, and they become isolated in the, the activities of the group. Well, I mean, even in Breaking Bad, he had a sweet spot, a little compassion there for his partner, right? So, yes, he does. And you talk about that in your research about compassionate instincts. So, yeah. again, I'm so curious to know, it, it, it does find the face of what one naturally thinks is about power. It's so striking, you know, and again, this is where we have these old ideas, you know, cultures have ideas. We have, we had ideas long ago about how you treat a, an illness, right? And you bleed people or you leech them, and those were bad ideas. Uh, and we have, old ide we have these old ideas about power, that it's really about violence and taking people down. And in fact, you know, time and time again, I'll give you a couple of examples. Studies find that people who are generous, who uh, give resources away, give opportunities away, rise in power, and just as critically, they keep their power. They have enduring legacies. So um, studies are finding, for example, um, that more uh, generous individuals of social networks tend to earn the respect and status of their peers. And in studies of organizations and military units, schools, it's kind of the more generous individual who enjoys enduring power, who doesn't fall from power, right? Uh, another really compelling example is um, in the political realm, and this really tests the Machiavellian hypothesis in the strongest way, and what you find, historians have rated the legacies of U.S. presidents, and you find that the, the great presidents um, were also really empathetic and kind. So Abe Lincoln uh, is, is most typically rated as the, has the greatest legacy of any president along with FDR and a few a couple others. Um, and, and he was defined by his, his interest in other people. And his empathy. Yeah, and his empathy. In the book, you're talking about social intelligence versus social Darwinism. So yeah. are, are we saying that, forget Darwin, <laughs> survival of the fittest and everything else? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, the, what we're starting to see is this juxtaposition, right, between you know, our old ideas about power, like social Darwinist ideas, survival of the fittest, take all your competitors down. Machiavelli even has phrases where he says, once you've risen to power to the position of the prince, kill your allies. <laughs> and that, you know, is kind of a, an earlier version of social Darwinism, but on this side, is, in this corner, is the social, socially intelligent way, which is like make good ties, get people to move, work well, give resources away, and so forth. Um, and, you know, I think that in general, 
the the data lend the they give the nod to this you know practice social intelligence be respectful listen carefully ask good questions um, you have to be tough at times obviously um, but uh, really focus on enhancing the welfare of others so let's talk about the paradox then because yeah, you you spend a lot of time <laughs> talking about how you get power and all this compassion and empathy and then you talk about the abuses. Yeah. And so what happens? I know. Well, this was, this was the, the striking thing that happened in my 25 years of studying power um, and teaching it for 20, you know, 15 years here at Haas. And, and you know, when I teach this, um, it's such a fascinating moment. Um, and, and, you know, leaders immediately recognize this. And in fact, I think the power paradox is it might be the central puzzle of human life, which is the following. As we've been discussing, we, we earn the respect of people. Um, you know, our teenagers at home, the people we work with, our, our critics, um, the members of our community, by doing the hard work that advances the welfare of many. And that's how we get power, right? Um, and that takes social intelligence. And it takes listening and empathy and, and really, you know, careful navigation of circumstances. And then here's the paradox, which is the feeling of power, right? Just suddenly when you feel, man, am I on top of my game, you know? What we know is you start feeling enthusiastic and empowered and hopeful and a little bit, you know, manic and arrogant and on top of the world. So you go to the dark side. And then the dark side comes in. And you are vulnerable to all of the abuses of power that we see in every day in our newspapers and in our history books. So what can we do? <laughs> when, we're, when we're leaders, whether we're at an organization, yeah. in, a, in a dorm room, in our life, what can we do to avoid that? Yeah, so, you know, I, I mean, I actually think it's pretty simple. So, and it starts by, you know, I see the abuses of power as almost warning signs, right? And they really, the abuses of power come in two categories. And one is what has been well documented and, you know, and, and people see this in their work all the time, which is what you might call empathy deficits, which is uh, people, when they're feeling powerful and no one's keeping them on, on, on their on their game, they, they really stop listening carefully, right? And so studies find when you feel powerful, you don't judge other people's emotions as accurately, you listen less carefully, uh, you have trouble taking other people's perspectives, right? Whereas you could do so when you felt less powerful and you're rising in the hierarchy. Um, you, you stop um, showing signs of compassion. You know, we have a study that shows that you know, if people feeling powerful are listening to another person talking about a really serious issue in their life, right, like the illness of a relative or trouble at work, um, once you feel powerful, you stop kind of making nice eye contact and, and connecting with the person. So the first abuse of power is the empathy, empathy deficits. And then the second is the stuff that, you know, is, is just... Uh, you see it in every culture, and you know it's just one of the most perplexing qualities of power is just a, you know a lot of impulsive behavior. And I like to say, you know, power kind of turns you into an impulsive sociopath. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you give people power in experiments, they speak more rudely. They're more likely to swear at people. They touch people inappropriately. We had a study where uh, you know we gave participants power they're working on a team we brought them in you know a nice plate of chocolate chip cookies um, the powerful person was more likely to take more cookies and eat the cookies really impulsively with their mouths open and cookies falling on their sweaters you know I, I mean there's no you know you can survey organizations it's the powerful person who's more likely to swear at colleagues more likely to have sexual affairs I mean it just it goes on and on right so those are warning signs, right? When you feel like you're not listening to people carefully, the empathy deficits, when you suddenly find yourself like, whoa, I just interrupted my colleague, or I swore at somebody, or I, I uh, yeah, that, you know, 
profane language is part of life, but, or you are feeling like you're, you know, impulsive, those are warning signs that you're going to lose your power, right? Um, and, you know, to your question, what do we do? Um, I think, you know, what's interesting is people are, if you look at what's happening in the, the study of organizations, practices in organizations, people are really getting interested in um, antidotes to the power paradox. Things like uh, how do you stay sort of uh, empathetic with your colleagues? How do you listen carefully? How do you handle stress well so you don't fly off the handle and shout at your team? So I think there are a lot of things you can do to counteract the, the abuses of power. So is the onus on those business leaders in those organizations to be self-aware, or is it something that you're looking for a movement that you know, we're codifying and, and kind of looking yeah. at what we need to do? Great question. I mean, I think it's really both. I think the great leaders, um, people like you know, the Abe Lincolns uh, of the world who, you know, who build up strong organizations, they know, they stay close to a set of practices that keeps them sharp, right? And it might be things like practicing gratitude and appreciation, which we know makes organizations strong. Or it might be things like telling good stories. You know, great leaders are great storytellers, and when they tell those stories, their teams and their organizations feel like, this is my identity, you know, I feel connected to this. Great leaders listen carefully. Great leaders are playful, right? You know, it's, it's funny, um, you know, the physicist Richard Feynman, I've, when I teach uh, leaders in the biotech world, and some of them were around him, were like, God, you know, he was brilliant, yes, but he was playful and funny, and it loosened up mm -hmm. and gave everybody a sense of camaraderie. So there are just the day-to-day -day stuff that can keep us sharp. Uh, and so you could, leaders need to be responsible for that. And then I think organizations need to build in opportunities for that. Um, How does that relate then to culture? at organizations yeah. because, and you've um, consulted, you've worked with Google and Facebook and, you know, Pixar, others, um, there's, look at Apple, you know, yeah. one could say, you know, with Steve Jobs, yeah. what, in terms of power, how, yeah. you know, so what do you have to say about culture? In yeah, business? you know, it's so interesting when you, um, when you step into an organization, right, and I've, thanks to Haas, I've had the chance to teach at Lawrence Livermore Labs and biotech companies and, you know, Google and Facebook and financial advising firms, really all sorts of different sectors. Mm -hmm. And, and what, you can, what you can, when you step in, you can immediately get a sense of where the culture is on these dimensions. And they'll just, people will tell you spontaneously, like, my leaders treat me with respect or not, right? Or, wow, my, you know, my leaders really are, are thoughtful and empathetic this is a really playful organization or not, and this is a, we tell great stories or not. And, you know, it's, um, so you can, you know, when you step into organizations, the, the sense of culture that you have about it can be captured with these qualities I've been talking about, right? Uh, about the properties of the social network. Is it, is there, is it open and free-flowing information or is it sort of, or not? Um, is it a, a respectful, appreciative culture or not? And that's what I go into working with, with the organizations around. What does it mean in terms of performance? I mean, at the organization, yeah. you know, in terms of this, this power that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. You know, so we intuitively recognize that these are, you know, and philosophers have been talking about this for a long time, people like Adam Smith, that gratitude and respect and empathy you know, being great storytellers are great human attributes, but do they enhance the bottom line? And, you know, in many ways, that's the, the key question uh, as organizations think about shifting culture in this direction. And, and you know, the, the data are rolling in um, that they do in really striking ways. So there are studies showing, for example, that managers who lead in more empathetic ways are just kind of asking the right questions and listening carefully and taking that minute to connect, um, their workers are more productive and have fewer sick days, right, because they feel respected. Uh, there are great studies of gratitude uh, in organizations now, you know, showing if managers just say thank you and are appreciative 
and mean it, you know, their workers will actually be more productive, for example, in uh, making more calls and soliciting more funds in fundraising. So a lot of the data are starting to show that as organizations move to these socially intelligent qualities, their, their workers are more committed, they're having more fun, they're working better, fewer sick days. So uh, it's good news at, for the bottom line. One of the interesting questions is, you know, what I've talked about is power and the paradox, you know, the, the unsuccessful qualities of Machiavellianism and ruthless violence in organizations and families. And there are a lot of data that's, that suggests these principles of empathy and gratitude and kindness and uh, work at the, um, uh, you know, the dyadic level between romantic partners. So, you know, one of the questions is how, how do we take these principles that work at organizations and then apply them to the international scene with nations and states and terrorist entities and the like. And I think we're learning really interesting things that are germane, you know. So one uh, that really struck me that was a, I saw as a challenge to the Machiavellian view of power at the international level is historians have rated, rated the success of, of um, protest movements, right? When you're a, a small entity like ISIS and you want to challenge power, and what they find is ruthless, violent strategies do not work, right? Uh, and rather, um, you know, more collaborative, nonviolent, consensus building strategies are successful. So, what that tells us historically, and this is an analysis of, uh, I think, over 500 kind of internation or political struggles, is ISIS is not going to work, right? Just on that basis alone, because people look at it and they go, sexual slaves, you're, you're, you're beheading people, you're torturing people, you're doing this, uh, no one will align with that as a broader demonstration of power or something. They, um, and then I think the other place where this is really, the principles we've been talking about really matter. And, and in fact, there's a complimentary conversation going on right now with people like Joseph Nye at Harvard. Uh, and you start hearing this, this concept of soft power, right? And that is juxtaposed to the older models of power, of hard power, of you go in and you blow things up and you get boots on the ground. And right now, I think we're seeing this shift in foreign policy to soft power, which is you have more enduring power mm -hmm. when you don't just strike out, when you don't just kill, and you instead build consensus, spread ideas, build norms, build institutions. And there are very, and that aligns with some of the stuff we've been talking about. You're only as good in terms of the respect and the strength of your social network, right? Shock and awe, which caused this mess, <laughs> most people believe, was a demonstration of pure hard power with no consensus and no collaboration, and it failed, right? And so diplomacy is moving more toward, you know, how many countries can you align? Are there are there democratic ways to build up support around this? Are there softer ways we can influence through like school, building schools or institutions? Mm -hmm. And that's where the enduring power will lie. And actually, you see it on the global um, scene is what happens as a reaction to that is compassion. Yeah, yeah. So everyone exactly. stand with Paris or yeah. stand, you know, what, what happened with 9-11. So you see yeah. linking of arms virtually. I always think about this evolutionarily. And it's so interesting, um, you know, you think about the, um, the uh, raw politics of the small groups in which we survived, right? And this is for hundreds of thousands of years. We lived in these small tribes of 100 people or so, right? Collaborating and cooperating uh, and, and, you know, facing violent raids against tribes nearby, mainly raids that were targeting Machiavellians in our group, by the way, which is interesting. Um, and most of the violence of the olden times was directed at Machiavellian types. So we live in these small groups, and anthropologists were lucky enough to study 48 of those societies. And 
and find out like who led those groups. And it again, it lends credence to this new mo this model of power I've been talking about, which is they were fair, generous, kind, mm -hmm. impartial, open to other people, uh, respected, uh, really it connected, right? Mm -hmm. But also they were cour courageous and knew how to fight the fight at the right moment. And I think that's true today, which is you go with the soft forms of power, and then if you cross your lines, you go after it, right? And, and that's the debate I think that's ha happening today, uh, that we have moved more towards softer power, just sh moving away from indiscriminate interventions. Mm -hmm. And then if they cross lines, we have to take action. One of the places that you consulted was Pixar, and yeah. I, I can't <laughs> leave without asking you about Inside Out. Yeah. So talk to us about that experience. Yeah. Well, that was, you know, it was a highlight of the career. So, you know, one of the one of the real delights of being here at Berkeley, you know, for 25 years, I run a big lab and I've worked on emotion and power and strong communities and social networks, and you know, gotten to for three and a half years work at Facebook and Google and the like, and uh, and and really one of the uh, just one of the shining moments of my career was this uh, consulting work as a scientist for Inside Out at Pixar. And it began, um, I was on a panel with Pete Docter, the director, who always does really deep research on his topics. Uh, and that was about nine years ago. And then before he started Inside Out, it takes about five years to make a film. He calls me up and he's like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this movie. And I'm like, well, I highly recommend it, you know, and, and it's going to be about emotion. I'm like, wow, you know, well, that's exciting. He's like, and it's going to be about how emotions are inside a person's head and then they shape the outside world. And I was like, well, that's what emotions are, right? And I'm going to do it in the, the main character is going to be an 11 year old girl. I'm like, ah, oh, good luck, you know? Um, and so he, um, I got to visit the campus, uh, Pixar's campus several times and meet with his team and, you know, meet with Pete individually and sort of watch the film develop and give talks on science of empathy and communication. And it was, uh, you know, I think it's the most important statement about what emotions are mm -hmm. and how important they are to not only families and identities, but, you know, as we're learning now about work and organizations, uh, that they are, emotions are the language of social life. And, and it's shown on the face. I know you've done a lot of work on like facial coding and all of that. Did you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've spent... Give uh, us your faces. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I mean, I, you know. Uh, I've spent more time coding facial expressions than any human being alive. You know, we've done more work on the voice than any lab. And these are amazingly important signals that we're emitting all the time that drive how credible you are at a pitch or how, how you do in a negotiation or... Um, does your team think you're trustworthy, right? It's, it's really through this, it's this ancient language that's been evolving for millions of years. And one of the great delights of Inside Out was to, you know, give a science talk on here's what we know about the face and voice, and then to see it play out in the film. You know, at the very end of the movie, um, the main character, Riley, reunites with her mom and dad and they have this nice embrace, and I study the power of touch on teams. Uh, and then she emits this little vocalization just about her delight in being connected to her parents again that we study in our lab. And, and they, they, they got the science absolutely right and, and really the fundamental lesson about how important emotion is to strong connection. So lessons for business? Leaders from Pixar's movie, yes? <laughs> well, I think... Is that required viewing, you know? For it is. <laughs> you know, and, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, I get emails about the movie almost every day, like it's changed my life. And I think that it, the, what it is saying is really what we've been talking about, right? Which is, you know, strong social ties are fundamental to organizations and creativity and innovation and, and commitment and trust. And they're rooted in what the film Inside Out really captured, which is, you know, listening carefully to other people, um, 
embracing emotion and letting you know people's emotions unfold and that certainly is part of being a great manager is to embrace the stresses and to find ways to transcend them to you know to be playful and to handle the difficulties of family life and work life in a playful spirit of mind um, and I think that you know uh, the lessons of that film the fundamental lesson is, is a one of social intelligence and about being empathetic and it, it works in every imaginable context. Any other final advice then to business leaders or people working in organizations? Yeah, you know, so I think, um, you know, one of the things that I've seen emerge in, you know, the 15 years teaching organizations, you know, we, we think of this stuff I've been talking about as like, you know, being empathetic, listening well, communicating with a lot of adroitness and, fidel and uh, refinement emotionally. We think of it as like, oh, some people have it and some people don't, right? Or, you know, being kind. And, and um, it's actually a set of skills, right? Like everything. You know, it's like a set of skills that you would incorporate in a great workout or things that you would add to your diet, right? And so these are just skills that you can practice every day. Uh, very intuitive, rooted in who we are as a species. And, and I would encourage, you know, man, and, and great leaders already know this. Like, wow, you know, what I've learned is I got to take a minute or two each day just to be grateful and appreciative of my colleagues. And it makes the world of difference. So treat it as something you can work on. Was there anything you wanted to say about the Greater Good Science Center? I didn't ask oh, sure. you a lot about yeah. that, um, yeah. but that probably feeds into what we're yeah. talking about too, the juxtaposition. And, you know, so you've yeah. been um, the the director. You created this. Yeah. Um, so talk about that. So you know, one of the things you know, one of the um, uh, things I'm most proud of out of life at Berkeley is the Greater Good Science Center. And 13 or 14 years ago, um, we got a gift from. Uh, the Hornadays were alumni of Berkeley. They just lost their daughter to early death of cancer. And they're, you know, it's kind of in the aftermath of 9-11, and there's a lot of deep questioning about where we are as a culture. And they, they were like, we want to build something that makes as many people in the world happy as possible. Um, and, and I think that I, you know, was starting to teach human happiness at Berkeley, and, and a lot of the data were saying that you know, if we go after materialistic things, it doesn't make us happy. If we create inequality, it makes us less happy. If we work too hard, it makes us less happy. So we're, and, and this is this age old question that was very poignant at the time, what makes us happy? And so we, we created out of their gift, the Greater Good Science Center. And what it does is it takes the seven or so big themes in the happiness stress literature, uh, and they're familiar themes for great organizations, gratitude, mindfulness, generosity, compassion, um, uh, you know, uh, being empathetic. And we take the best science, we distill it into very um, viral, readable essays, and now we've built out something called Greater Good in Action, which is if you are interested in developing a practice at work or in your family or at your school around these themes of gratitude and empathy and compassion, what we've been talking about, here's what you can do, right? Here's a little one minute exercise you can do that's been tested by science. Um, and the, the idea is to take the science and just give it away, right? To schools and hospitals and nurses and prisoners and teachers and organizations and Google and so forth and Facebook. And, and uh, we have about a million visitors to the website each year. Uh, we've got um, institutes for teachers and lots of stuff happening in the workplace. So it's right there for free, greatergood.berkeley.edu. Uh, and we hope uh, that you know, people take it and then they do with it what they're uniquely designed to do. Mm -hmm. Is there science around, I mean, we all know that when we, we give, we yeah. feel good. Is there actual data? Oh, like yeah. What happens in the brain? Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's an amazing story, which is, 
You know, we've thought way too narrowly about self-interest and happiness, you know, and we, you, you survey the average American, I think it's changing though, but like 15 years ago, to be like, oh, it's really about making more money, then I get my self-interest is enhanced, having more material goods, experiencing more personal pleasures. That's the, that's the game. That's what Adam Smith was interested in, and, and that's what drives healthy societies forward. And that's partially true. Um, but there's this new science on, and it, and it makes sense when you go back in the deep evolutionary story of, of how collective and collaborative we are. You know, we're the only primate that really kind of gathers food and hunts and, and feeds each other and shares food, right? Um, and, and you could go on with examples like that. And what happened is our brains became wired so that we actually enjoy giving things away, right? Which doesn't make sense from a very narrow view of self-interest. So brain studies, fine. If somebody gives me uh, some money, it activates an old part of the brain called the ventral striatum where dopamine circuits are. And, and that's, it, it's experienced as reward. But when I give that money away, I have the same active pattern of activation. Giving has the same brain reward activation as receiving. Um, there are other studies that show, even more on point, that if I give money away, um, I get a boost in my happiness. And if I spend it on a materialistic desire, my happiness goes down, right? There are other studies that show if I give resources away, uh, the t people that I'm working with in an organization will do better work and they'll respect me more. So, so we've, it's been built into us to share. Does that relate then to why people are good mentors? You know, yeah. Is that a giving? Oh yeah, you know. And, and I think that um, the, um, you know, probably the, the defining characteristic of who's identified as, as great mentors and leaders is their generosity, right? Is their, that, and, and it's in some sense in the service of their own self-interest because their careers will end, right? Their organizations will end, uh, and and their legacy is defined by who who carries on their traditions, right? Do they give away tools and ideas and resources and opportunities that keep things going? So it's it, there are a lot of reasons to give. Well, thank you for that positive note on the end. Um, really enjoyed the time talking with you. Well, thank you. Thank it's you. Been a, it's been a, Real fun. And good luck with the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.